Okay, so uh, I mean, if you want to work on something else, you can work. But there are in the origo. You know that in chapter one we are not following the origo book. We will come back to origo book from chapter two. But there are three problems that are very interesting in the section of mathematical induction in the origo book, and the, I think they are extremely challenging. Okay, so let us try uh, to address them. So one problem is problem twelve forty five. You can see it in your book. And we are supposed to use mathematical induction to prove this. 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times, uh, no, 3 times 4 plus 1 over, so plus up to 1 over uh, 2n minus 1 multiplied by 2n. We are supposed to prove this is equal to 1 over n plus 1 uh, plus 1 over n plus 2 plus up to 1 over 2n. I really like this problem because you might think that always p of 1 is very easy. Uh, so interpreti interpreting this is extremely challenging. I hope that if you can survive this, it means that you really understood. So let us say that this is p of n. You want to prove it using mathematical induction. So the first thing that you need to check is, is it, is it true or false for p of 1? Is p of 1 true or false? Okay? So I want to give you time because I don't want to spoil the joy of solving the problem. So I want you to think a little bit about writing this down. p of 1, p of k, and p k plus 1. Even writing p of k plus 1 is challenging a little bit. Okay, so I want to, to think about this. The reason it is challenging, because the right-hand side starts with n. n is involved even in the first term on the right-hand side. Okay, so if you can solve it, of course it's good. But at least I expect you to write p of 1 correctly. p of k is easy, you just replace n with k. But then I want you to write the proper form of p of k plus 1. I, I really like this problem, okay, if you want to use mathematical induction to prove. So I will give you enough time to think. Okay, any ideas? Okay, because uh, let, me, let me start, I will ask you a lot of questions, but because if, uh, I know that what is going to happen, the algebra becomes a little bit involved. So I want to introduce some notations to write them a little bit, because I'm lazy to write everything down every time. So let us try to do this. If you don't mind, let me call this part a n. For, I will call this a n because this is something which depends on n. So let me call it a sub n. And let me call this b sub n. My goal is to prove a n is equal to b n using mathematical induction. And if you don't mind, instead of proving that a n is equal to b n, let me prove that a n minus b n is zero. If a n minus b n is zero, it means a n is equal to b n. So don't uh, uh, resist about these things. You will see that the algebra becomes so involved and it, you will appreciate it later. But this is just minor things. So my mathematical statement that I want to prove using mathematical induction can be simply written as a n minus b n equals to zero. Okay? So first of all, are you with me or not? I'm just introduced two notations, but that's my goal. Okay, the first thing that I need to check is P of 1. Okay? So P of 1 means what? Means A1 minus B1 equals to 0. It might be true or might be false. I have to check that, yes, this is true. So, is a1 minus b1 equal to 0? In order to do that, I need to know a1, I need to know b1 to see if that they are equal. Okay, now that is my question for you. I don't think you will face any problems with a1. So, can you tell me what is a1? a n means you start from 1 over 1 times 2 and then you continue this pattern until you hit this term. Now n is given to be 1. So what is a1? 
just forget about the right hand side. This is a n. So what is a one? Can you tell me? One over two. One over what times two? Yes. Which is how much? One over. Two. And then if I ask you what b one is. I want you to understand exactly what, first of all, you know that this is a little bit strange. When you put these dots, it means you continue the pattern. Can you tell me why suddenly it becomes 2 end? Yes? Because you're adding n, so in the first term you're adding 1, second you're adding 2, so it becomes n plus n. Yes, is that right? So it, it means this is a little, bit con a little bit unusual because n is also involved from the first term. So whatever n I give you, you will start from 1 over the n that I give you plus 1, the n that I give you plus 2, and then you continue this pattern until you at some point reach to the n that I give you plus n. But instead of writing n plus n, they have written 2n. So first of all, understanding the pattern. Okay, now can you read what is b1 then? It's 1 over 1 plus 1. Do I stop there? Yes. Because you are, you are supposed to stop when you reach to n plus n for the given n. Here, the given n is 1, so you write the given n plus 1. You already reach to the end, you will stop. So this is B1. Okay? Is that understandable? So this means that, yes, that's correct. So this is equivalent to saying that 1 half minus 1 half is 0 which is true. Okay, I don't want to spend time on PK because PK is very easy. So what PK means, PK means, uh, means A sub K minus B sub K equals to zero, assumed to be true. Okay, now I want to prove this for, pay, uh, for the next level. So it means that I need to write a k plus 1 minus b k plus 1 equals to 0 to be proven. This is the hard part. Actually, the hard part here is not, I would say, algebra. If you are good in algebra, you will not face any problems. But interpreting a k plus 1 and a k plus 2, and I don't think you will face any problems with a k plus 1, technically speaking, because we have enough experience of these dots. So, can you tell me what is a k plus 1? I have to rewrite this assuming that n is k plus 1. So, just replace n with k plus 1, but in pair of brackets. So, it becomes 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 3 times 4 plus up to which step so can you do this in your head if I replace n with k plus 1 so this becomes 2k plus 2 understandable so I replaced n with k plus 1 I multiplied by 2 it becomes 2k plus 2 and if I replace n with k plus 1 and then I have a minus 1 so it becomes 2k plus 2 minus 1, 2k plus 1. Okay, and then you know that why I left this space a little bit empty, because I told you that usually in these problems we have enough experience, it is always instructive, or, yeah, so to write constructive, to write the previous term. But what the previous term is? What the previous term is? It's all 1 over what? So 2k minus 1 times 2k. Yes, do you agree? So this is ak plus 1. But then, if I ask you what this part is, what is your answer? It's just ak. So it means that a sub k plus 1 is nothing except ak plus 1 over 2k plus 1 times 2k plus 2. So far, so good. I'm not doing anything right because this is what I want to prove. First, I want to analyze what AK plus 1 is and what BK plus 1 is. I realize that AK plus 1 
is a sub k plus an extra term. Yes? So I want you to tell me, I want to wait for you for telling me what is b of, uh, sub k plus 1 and how is it related to b k sub k? No worries, no worries. So what is b sub k plus 1 and how it is related to uh, b sub k? Yes, Simon? Should I say the simple No, tell me how to derive it. If I want to write b sub k plus 1 from scratch, this is my bn, so I want to write b sub k plus 1. I know that I have to replace n with k plus 1. How should I write that? Of course, I replace k with n with k plus 1. But be careful a little bit. So this becomes, if you don't mind, let me put it in a pair of brackets. So I'm replacing every appearance of n with k plus 1. So then what happens, the next one becomes 1 over k plus 1 plus 2. And this pattern will continue until where? So this pattern will continue until I reach to which number? k plus 1 is fixed. You see, n is fixed in all of them. I continue until I reach to n plus again n. But n is k plus 1 here, so I will continue until k plus 1 is fixed from the beginning. I will continue until the second number 1, 2 becomes what? k plus 1. Yes? Is that understandable? This is b k plus 1. But I want to understand what is the relation of bk plus 1 to bk. So can you tell me what is the previous term? It is important to tell me what is the previous term. Of course, the numerator is 1. Yes, that is the correct one. Is that right? You are not allowed to change k plus 1 because you see when I say n, n is always there. The second number, the second summand is changing from 1 to n. So when I tell you go to the previous term, the previous term is this one. Is that understandable? Yes? Okay, so you see k plus 1 is fixed. But uh, we don't have bk. What is bk? bk is this expression when I replace n with k. So it means that I need one more term. This is a little bit unusual in mathematical induction. So what is the previous term? What is the previous term to this is 1 over k plus 1, which is always fixed, but plus k minus 1. Okay? Then that is enough now. It was a little bit deviation. Usually in these kinds of problems, we, had, we, need, we needed only the previous term. But here we need this one as well. Why? Uh, because I want to find the connection uh, between this and bk. So can you tell me what to do? How, to, uh, how should I manipulate the algebra? Yes, boy? I guess uh, bk plus the two last terms minus uh, one of the Yes, two. minus. That minus one is important. Yes, because we have to start with, because it starts with k plus 2. Yes, but bk starts with k plus 1. Exactly, so we understand everything. So this becomes equal to, so from here to here is not unfortunately bk, but it doesn't deviate a lot. This is bk, but minus uh, the first term, yes? Am I right? So that is, that is the hard part of it. So if you know, it means that you're really in a good shape. So, so that's exactly. So this one, because if you see what is the number here, k and k add together, and 1 and 1 are cancelled. So it is 2k, and that is exactly what I want if I replace n with k. So 2k is okay. Yes? But the problem is that this becomes k plus 2, this becomes k plus 3 until I reach to 2k.
But when I say BK, it should start from K plus 1, which is not here. So this is not whole, this is close to BK, but it lacks the first term. So this is not BK. This is BK minus the first term. Yes? Okay, good. So this means that BK plus 1 is equal to BK minus 1 over K plus 1. And then I have to add these two terms to this. So it becomes 2K plus 1. And the next one becomes 2K plus 2. And if you don't mind, let me factor a 2 out. Okay, so let me see. Yeah, so I want you to know that this is the correct way of finding the connection between B sub K plus 1 and the previous one B sub K. Well, that was actually what I said It's the hard part. If you understand that, but there's nothing left except some simple algebra. Is that clear? Okay, so now I want to write a sub k minus b sub k plus 1, uh, sorry, a sub k plus 1 minus b sub k plus 1 and convince myself that this is indeed equal to 0. But I'm not empty-handed. I know that a k minus b k is already 0. Okay, so I, let us do the algebra together. Uh, so what we do, so a therefore, a sub k plus 1, minus b sub k plus 1 is equal to. Instead of a sub k plus 1, I put this expression in, yes? Instead of a sub k plus 1, I put this expression. And if you don't mind, let me factor a 2 out here. So this becomes a sub k plus, I factor a 2 out, and then it becomes 2k plus 1. The last one becomes just simply k plus one. This is a this is a sub k plus one minus b sub k plus one is this bigger expression, so it becomes b sub k minus one over k plus one plus one over two k plus one, and then plus one over two k plus one. Okay, I want to wait. If you have any questions, let me know. Because the rest of it is just simple algebra. Any questions? So far? Understandable? Okay, so let us just do that. I open up the pair of brackets. This minus sign goes for all of them. But I would write it as A sub K minus B sub K. Okay, plus I will write this again. I wrote this. I multiply the minus sign in, so the next one becomes positive. The next one becomes negative. And the next one becomes negative. But what can I write for this? This is assumed to be true. That a sub k minus b sub k is zero. Yes, so this is zero by my assumption. And the rest is on me. I have to co convince myself this is also zero. One way to do it is to take the common denominator. Between these, what is the common denominator? I hope that you agree with me. This is enough. Yes, so 2, 2k two plus 1, k plus 1. So no rescaling has happened. So I just copy and paste its numerator. But if I compare this one with that one, a factor of 2 and a factor of 2k plus 1 has been multiplied here, so I have to rescale the numerator exactly by the same factor. And then when I come here, it's minus. I compare this denominator with that one, so these two factors should be multiplied there. And finally, when I reach to the last one, the sign is still negative. 
If I compare this one with that one, this is the only factor. So I have to rescale the numerator as well with the same factor. And if we haven't done something wrong, it should be zero. Let us check it out. So this becomes equal. I don't touch the denominator. I multiply, uh, so two in, so it becomes four K plus two. I multiply minus two in, minus two K minus two. I multiply the minus sign in. So do you think it's working? Yes. Because four K minus two K minus two K, that's gone. Two minus two, gone. One minus one, gone. So it becomes zero. Yes? So we were able to prove this. Now, hopefully, you understand why I introduced these notations. Otherwise, it would be hard to write it all the time. So that was a good question. I mean, I didn't expect this to be uh, in Origo book. Yeah, understandable? The next question is also very interesting because you know that in, in this file that we are working, mainly the induction appears in algebra. This question, the next question in Origo is very interesting. We prove something in geometry using mathematical induction. Okay, and that is the question is this. So this is question 1246. Uh, so I will tell it to you and then wait for you a little bit to think. So. 46 the question is this we want to find so we want to find the number of diagonals of a rig of a, any polygon with n sides of course i mean convex polygons okay so for example if i have if i have a quadrilateral how many diagonals i have i have this and i have this if i have a pentagon you don't need to have a regular pentagon one two three four and five yes so how many how many diameters so how many diagonals you have for example here is a diameter so uh, diagonal that is also a diagonal i don't know that is also a diagonal uh, this is also a diagonal that's also a diagonal if I count them here, it was two. If I count the diagonals here, it turns out to be five as the same number as edges. But the point is that there is a claim here. They claim that dn means the number of diagonals of an n-gon. N-gon means a shape with n sides. They claim prove this. This is n times n minus 3 divided by 2. And n is the number of sides. Of course, the smallest polygon is triangle. And what? how many diagonals are there? Zero. Zero. And the formula gives you the correct answer. If n is 3, the, the number of diagonals is 0. But let us say n is 4. 4 times 1 divided by 2 is 2, and that is correct. Let us say n is 5. So it becomes 5 times 2 divided by 2, which is 5. That's correct. So they are claiming that the number of diagonals in any convex n gone. So convex, I, forget about the word convex. I don't want to distract you. It just means the normal polygon that you have. We want to prove that the number of diagonals follow this formula in which n is the number of sides. You want to prove this using mathematical induction. And of course, in this case, the lowest possible n is 3. So the base of induction is not 1. Okay? So this is your Pn. So you need to check P3 first, not P1. So then it means D3 is equal to 3 times 0 over 3. So, sorry, over 2. So it is equal to Z, and this is true. Why? You have to write a little bit of words, because in a triangle, we do not have any diagonals, so this formula gives you the correct answer. And then the rest of it, I want to wait for you, okay? So that is good, because this is probably the first problem you see that mathematical induction 
has some applications in geometry. So whenever you want to prove something about a natural number, one of the methods that comes to mind is mathematical induction. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, that's the idea. Because you have to use mathematical induction, we, you, you might have other arguments for that. Okay, so, but here we want to do using mathematical induction. Uh, okay, so if you don't mind, let us start solving because there will be one more problem. Uh, I want to solve. So, what is your opinion? So, here, this is the claim. The number of diagonals of any n gone is equal to the number of sides n times n minus 3 divided by 2. We check it for 3, and it was true because d3 means a 3 gone. A 3 gone is a triangle, and you know that there are no diagonals there. So that claim is at least correct for this case. Now we assume that k is a number, so in principle you have to write it down. So I would say let k greater than or equal to 3 be a natural number. Number such that Uh, P of K is true. We prove that P of K plus 1 is also true. Okay, but what is the meaning of P of K be true? P of K means what? Uh, means d sub k is equal to k times k minus 3 divided by 2. So there is a claim into it, yes? It claims that if you have a k gone, where k is greater than or equal to 3, the number of diagonals is this number. So this is assumed to be true. We want to show that P of k plus 1 is also true. But what is the claim in P sub k plus 1? It claims d sub k plus 1, which means the number of diagonals in a k plus 1 gone is equal to what? Replace k with k plus 1. Replace k with k plus 1, so it becomes k minus 2, and then divided by 2. So to be proven. Oh, they have insisted to use mathematical induction. So it means that somehow you need to find a way to connect this number to the, this number. You need to know uh, how the number of diagonals in a k plus 1 gone, a, an n gone having one more side, is related to the number of diagonals to, of the k gone. Okay? So I don't know. I, I have to give you some... Uh, Argument. So let us try to say that I have an I, I consider a k plus one gone. A k plus one gone in consists of k plus one vertices. So let us say that this is the first vertex, second, the third, I don't know, the fourth, and then I continue here, for example, k minus two, sorry, a sub k minus two. Let me write minus one and then a sub k minus a sub k, and then finally a sub k plus 1. So this means that, for example, let us consider this is your... I don't know, this is your k plus 1 gone. Yes? So I have a, and I have a shape with k plus 1 vertices and k plus 1 sides. That is a k plus 1... Uh, so, uh, k plus 1 gone. I want to count the number of diagonals in this shape and confirm that the number of diagonals is this. Okay? But I don't want to start empty-handed. So, I don't know. I know something about the number of diagonals of a k gone. So, how can I relate them? 
Yeah. So because I want to count all the diagonals here, so let us try, for example, let us take this one and connect it here. Okay. So I partition this k plus 1 gone into two parts. One part is a triangle. Okay, but tell me, what is the name of the other part? It's a k gone. Yes? And then one thing is important. Do you agree with me? Any diagonal that I draw for the k gone will serve as a diagonal of k plus 1 gone. Yes. yes? So if I draw this diagonal, even though I drew the diagonal here, but this is still the diagonal of the bigger shape. So any diagonal here is also should a diagonal of the bigger one, so it should be counted. Okay? But the number of diagonals of the k-gon is clear. So let me write this. I hope that you agree with me. The number of diagonals in the bigger shape means the number of diagonals of a k plus 1 gone is the number of diagonals of the k-gon. Because whatever diagonal you count here, it is also automatically a diagonal of the bigger one. So that is not wrong. But we have to do some adjustments. What are those adjustments? So, yes, yeah, Thrasmus, you can say this. Yeah. We have, um, so we have the k edge or the k vertices, yes, potentially pair or k plus one vertex width. Yes. But we can't pair it with the two that are right next to it. Yes. Or that, that are directly connected to it. It's just uh, talking about my shape, in my shape name. So we, we can't connect it with a sub 1 or a sub k. Yes. Uh, since those wouldn't be edges, since they, those are already connected. Yeah. With a normal, with a normal edge. So then it's just we add k more new potential pairings minus those two. So, d sub k plus k minus 2. k? Minus 2. We, we add k minus 2. But we, one thing should also be considered. Yes, Simon? You have to add 1 because... The you have to add 1. Yeah. Because this was serving as an edge. Now, now it serves us as a diagonal. That's the only thing. So, that's the only thing that I want you to know. So, for example, you see... This is a diagonal of the k-gon. It is also a diagonal of this one. So I hope that you agree. Whatever diagonal I draw here, it will serve as a diagonal of the bigger one as well. So the number of diagonals of the k plus 1 gone is the number of diagonals of the smaller shape. But there are some diagonals of the bigger shape that I haven't counted yet. What, this is what Rasmus was saying. Which diagonals I haven't counted yet that for the bigger shape? Which diagonals I haven't counted? You see, the diagonals which is connected to AK plus 1. These are not counted. So this is, so let me draw it with a different color. So for example, this one is not counted yet. Yes, because this is only the diagonal of the bigger shape, but not the diagonal of the cake on. So this hasn't been considered. But how many of these orange ones I have? One orange one is this one. The other orange one that I haven't considered is this one. The other orange one that I haven't considered is this one. So how many of these orange ones I haven't considered? K minus 2. Because uh, if I connect this to this, it is an edge. If I connect this to this, it is an edge. But if I connect this to any other vertices, it is a diagonal. It's an orange line. So I have to count the number of orange lines. So the total number of vertices is k plus 1. Two of them will give me a, a side, an edge, which shouldn't be counted as a diagonal or the orange line. So there are, how many of them are left? So let me write here. So I have to add k plus 1 minus, uh, minus 3. Yes? Because uh, k plus 1 is also not considered. Yes? It's k plus 1 minus 3. You see, how many of these orange lines I have? In total, I have k plus 1 vertices. Three vertices are gone. How many vertices are left? k plus 1 minus 3. Is that right? But there is one loophole here. If you think that is enough, that is not because 
when I was counting the diagonals of the cake on, I didn't count this because it was, I didn't count this because it was an edge. But now this is serving as a diagonal again. So I have to add one unit to this one as well. I don't know, hopefully uh, we haven't done any mistakes. Is that right? Yes. So now if I have done everything right, instead of dk, I put this and do the algebra, hopefully I can arrive to this. But let us, before doing that, because this is always easy to come back and fix things, let us make sure that 100% what we are doing is correct. Are, do you agree with me? Yes? So dk is the number of diagonals in this shape, plus the number of orange lines, the number of orange lines that I can draw, I can add one more to it here, the number of orange lines, so, so this is the number one, number two, number three, up to here. These are all orange lines that I have. How many of them are there? Yes? I can connect this to every vertex except these three. Okay? So K plus one is the total number of vertices. Three of them is not useful for drawing the orange line, so I take them off. But there is one edge, there is one line which was an edge for this. Now you see this is a diagonal again. So I have to add one unit to it. So let us let us uh, uh, do the calculation. So what happens? Instead of dk, I put the formula from my assumption uh, plus, this is just, let us calculate. k plus 1 minus 3 is k minus 2, but plus another 1, which is k minus 1. And then I take the common denominator. So this becomes k times k minus 3 plus 2 times k minus 1. And I have to simplify, so I multiply. So k squared minus 3k plus 2k minus 2 divided by 2. So this becomes k squared minus k minus 2 divided by 2. And then I factorize it, yes? I need two numbers whose sum is minus 1, the product is minus 2. What are those numbers? Uh, negative 2 plus 1. Yes? And that is that number, yes? So k minus 2, k plus 1. So we succeeded to show that d sub k plus 1 is indeed this number. Well, that was also a good problem. At least you see how you can use uh, mathematical induction and proving something in geometry as well. Okay, the last one is in trigonometry. I will write it down here and wait for you again. And then that would be the end of today's lesson. Of course, I will not give uh, so hard questions in the exam, but you see that in some books. So I think the exercises in the Origo book is not as good as this PDF file when it comes to number theory, but suddenly it improves itself when it comes to induction. Okay, so that is the last question we want to solve today. Uh, I don't know if you have enough formulas, but let me just write it. You can Google it if you want to, any formula. So, question number 1247. We want to prove this using mathematical induction on n. Cosine x, x is a real number, plus cosine 3x plus cosine 5x, we want to write cosine of odd multiples of x and add them. So it is very interesting that we can have a closed formula for it. So plus cosine 2n minus 1x, we want to prove that this sum is can be written more compactly as sine 2nx divided by 2 sine x. I mean, if you think, it is very interesting, yes? So if I have the sum of cosines of odd multiples of x from number 1 up to the nth term, instead of looking at this sum, this sum is just equal to this fraction. And don't get confused. This is sine. 2nx is the angle in front of sine, and x is the angle in front of sine. So we want to prove this. 
course, here I don't need to mention that this induction should be done on n because x is a real number. You cannot do induction on real numbers. Uh, so if you don't mind, let me give you a hint. This formula that you might need is not directly there. So uh, this formula, you need to prove this formula first at some point. Sine of alpha, 2 times sine alpha. Of course, this is not something... I mean, you have to be a little bit creative. Yeah. This is not something that you cannot. But this one, you need to convince yourself that this is equal to sine alpha plus beta and minus sine alpha minus beta. Okay, so you will need this at some point. Of course, you in the formula sheet, you have the formula for this. You also have the formula for this. But then first you have to convince yourself that this combination is this. Which is extremely simple, of course. Let me see if I have done it right. No, I think. It is a plus there. Sorry. It's a plus there. Mm, sine, cosine. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so it's very, of course. I wrote it here on the board so that you can use this if you want to. And then I don't think that would be hard at all. Uh, so if you don't mind, let us solve it at least together because the time is running. Uh, first of all, tell me, are you happy with this formula? Because if you check this formula, it is sine alpha cosine beta plus the other way around. This is sine alpha cosine beta minus the other way around. So the minus signs will, the second terms will cancel, but the first term will add up and then this will happen. So that is extremely easy to prove. You will see why we need this one. Okay. Let us call this one P. Let us call this one P n as usual. The first thing I need to check is the truth or falsity of uh, P of 1. So what is P of 1? Cosine of, X. Cosine of X only. I need to ask myself and then replace n with 1. So this becomes sine 2x equals to 2 sine x. I need to ask myself, is this true or false? And that is true, but if you don't mind, let me start from the right-hand side to convince you that this is indeed true. Because if you check the formula sheet, sine 2x can be written as 2 sine x cosine x. That's the double angle formula for sine. And then I copy and paste the denominator, and then immediately you see that you are done, because this and that are gone. And then you get cosine x, and that is equal to the left-hand side. So this is just, this is the first time we have to prove a little bit for even P1. So yes, P1 is true, and that is the proof. Now we assume that this is true for K, so P of K. So I just copy and paste everything, but I put what? K at the end. Okay, assumed to be true. And then I want to prove that this is also true for the next level. And then you have uh, enough experience how to write them down. So let me just write it quickly. I replace k with k plus 1, but of course in pair of brackets. So how the last term will read k to k plus 1, so it becomes 2k plus 2 minus 1. So it becomes 2k plus 1, x. And on the right-hand side, I replace k with k plus 1 in pair of brackets. To be proven, yes. Are you happy what I have written? Am I doing it right? Yes, that's what we want. And then you know that I start from the left-hand side of what I want to show, and then uh, based on experience, you know it's always better to write the previous term here so that you can know how to use this. So the, what's the previous term? It's exactly 2k minus 1x, and then I would write that one as well. Okay, so what can I do? 
instead of from here to here, I have something. So instead of this one, which appears here as well, I take it off and replace it with that. So this becomes sine 2kx divided by 2 sine x. But of course, after this, this is left. Yes? But then I have to simplify this in uh, using my trigonometry knowledge so that I can prove this one is equal to that one. At least you see that you have two expressions here. My goal is to combine them into one expression. So this motivates me to take the common denominator. Yes? So what happens? So it becomes sine 2kx. The common denominator is 2 sine x and then plus it becomes 2 sine x cosine uh, 2k1 plus 2k plus 1x okay do you agree so I took the common denominator and this is this and now this is why I anticipated what is going to happen and I gave you that formula. So if you compare this second term with what I have written here as that formula, I will give the role of alpha to x, and I will give the role of beta to 2k plus 1x. Yes? I need a minus sign. I don't know where this minus sign has gone. Ah, it will come, it will come. Okay, so here, do you agree? So this is the combination that I anticipated and wrote the formula here for you. I give the role of alpha to x, and I, gave, I give the role of beta to 2k plus 1, and then I just use the formula. So I copy and paste the first term, the numerator, and the denominator. Okay? But now, what happens? According to the formula that I wrote by combining two addition and subtraction formulas, this becomes sine of alpha, which is x, plus beta, which is 2k plus 1x. Do you agree? Plus sine of the difference. Okay, so since there's no time, if you don't mind, let me just simplify these things here. If I simplify it, it is x, I multiply this in, it becomes 2kx plus another x. I multiply x in. And now x plus x is 2x, so it becomes 2kx plus 2x. Here, I x... I multiply x and minus sign in, it becomes minus 2x minus x. And this x and that x are gone, so it is just simply minus 2kx. More or less it is finished. So this becomes sine of 2kx plus. Here I have 2kx. I have 2x and I have a sign. So I would write sign. If you don't mind, what I will do, I will factor a 2 from the left. I will factor an x from the right. It becomes this. But here, I have sign of not 2x, of minus x. But we also know that sine of minus alpha is minus sine alpha. Yes. So sine of minus 2x, this minus sign goes out, it becomes minus sine 2kx. And then we are done. Divided by 2 sine x. So what is happening now? The first term and the last term are cancelled. So I will get sine 2k plus 1x divided by 2 sine x. And that is exactly what I want to come up with. So that's exactly equal to the right hand side. Yes. 
So these three problems, I would say that they are nice problems. One was a little bit hard from algebraic point of view. The second one was in geometry. The third one was in trigonometry. Okay, so now I think your collection of problems is more or less good at this level for mathematical deduction. Any questions? Okay, thank you.